Historically, animals were able to move through the ecosystems all across the state much more easily than they are today. You could have cougars that could very easily crisscross the entire state in a matter of weeks. There are amphibians that just migrate a couple hundred yards. Elk move throughout the year. In the wintertime, they come to our lowland forested areas where they can access food a little bit more easily. And then during the summer, they need to be able to move up high. Even small species such as fritillary butterflies and other types of pollinators migrate across the landscape. There are very few species that don't migrate or move in some capacity. humans came in and we just drew lines. We drew lines with roads, we drew lines with railroad tracks, we drew lines with dams in the water and fences. And so that makes it difficult for animals to move across the landscape. Habitat connectivity is the degree to which the landscape allows ecological flows, like animal movement. It's essentially the opposite of habitat fragmentation. Everywhere developments exist, anywhere we have populations of people, anywhere we have roads, there's definitely habitat fragmentation. Wildlife connectivity is just like human connectivity. People need the ability to go to stores and school, to move when things get too cold or too hot, and animals need the exact same. Changing the movements of wildlife is a very big deal. We have more negative interactions with humans and wildlife, and it affects their ability to survive. Pronghorn are commonly known to make very long distance migrations. As they're reintroduced, there are going to be major challenges with habitat connectivity for that specific species. Even something like a small fence that any person could step over may be a complete barrier to their movements. Western toads are a really interesting and important native amphibian that also needs connectivity. The toads lay their eggs and produce tadpoles in our small wetland and stream environments. And then as they grow up into adult toads, move up into the uplands. And so we have adult toads and toadlets trying to cross the roadways and unfortunately being run over by cars or people who don't realize that those toads are trying to make a great migration. Too much light in some places can fragment habitat, too much noise. A barn built on a, a riverside. Some of the bigger barriers are cities and development, interstates, highways, traffic. If we want to see viable wildlife populations have healthy ecosystems, then we need to absolutely focus on and work on habitat connectivity in the state of Washington. My name's Jason Fedora. I'm with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, and I'm the wildlife biologist for Benton and Franklin counties. Standing in Franklin County at one of the irrigation canals, we've got hundreds of miles of these uh, across the eastern Washington uh, irrigated landscape. So the design of these is really good for transporting water, but really difficult for animals to cross or get out of. Once inside the canal, deer and elk and hoofed animals find it really difficult to escape. Animals often get drawn into canals just by trying to follow natural migratory corridors. Oftentimes, if we're able to get an animal out, we find that the hooves have been worn down from trying to climb up the concrete sides, that the hooves have been worn down to the bone. And often, euthanization is the only uh, humane option at that point.
We need to find a way to coexist together so that wildlife can move freely once again through the landscape. I feel like Washington State has some of the best minds uh, working on habitat connectivity issues, and we know what to do. We know where to do it. We know how to do it. Reducing fragmentation and creating a connected landscape for wildlife will require changes, but not giant changes. A uh, tried and true method of solving habitat fragmentation that's caused by roads is building wildlife crossing structures. And you may have seen one on Interstate 90, just east of Snoqualmie Pass. We're seeing new species show up, like moose. We recently had a moose cross from north to south at an underpass called Resort Creek within the Snoqualmie Pass East project area. That one probably came out of the North Cascades. And we do know there's habitat south of I-90 that could support moose. I just think maybe they've never been able to reach it before wildlife crossings were built in, on I-90. There are things that irrigation distribution systems can do to make things better for fish and wildlife and better for the farms at the same time. So as the Kittitas Reclamation District enters its aggressive water conservation program, we always take into consideration animal safety so we can get them out. We actually install animal escape ramps specifically designed for getting animals out of a canal system where they can get their footing, they can walk up and they can just jump over that and then off they go. The area of US 97 between approximately Riverside and Tanasket is, no matter how you slice it, the top three worst deer vehicle collision areas in the state. It's also an important ecological area. There's been a lot of work, primarily by Conservation Northwest over the years, to find the money to upgrade that corridor, to install one mile of fencing south of Janus Bridge over the Okanagan River we saw essentially a 91% drop in collisions in that fence section as well. We can all make a difference in wildlife connectivity. So if you bring in citizens and local landowners, you can come up with solutions. Reach out to a habitat biologist at the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, whose job it is, is to provide technical assistance and advice on how the public can design and improve their land. It can be as simple as a small connected patch of flowers or native plants in a person's yard or in their neighborhood. Urban planners, especially for cities and counties and at the state level, are some of the most important people for making sure that we have wildlife connectivity into the future. I think the real way to know that we've achieved our goal is that our planning processes include wildlife connectivity at the very beginning. This is a massive issue that has the potential to affect practically every species in the state. We can't not afford to do wildlife connectivity projects. Think about the impact it would have if we lost our elk and our deer. Washington has such an amazing array of wildlife and ecosystems and habitats. It's what makes living here so special. To keep it that way, we need healthy and connected habitats. <laughs>